Good morning, church. Welcome to the jungle. We have fun and games, and we'll you know, welcome to Logan Elm Baptist Church. It's good to see you. My name is Tom Bastris. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are here the week of VBS to celebrate and to enjoy and to have fun, but also to make sure that our young people hear the gospel and have opportunity to respond with repentance and faith. And so VBS is one of those times of the year that is a lot of fun, but a lot of work. And this past week, the ladies and their, and their kids have been in here working hard. Working hard. And uh, so I'm just thankful for everyone's work that has been put into that. Speaking of that, at the end of our service this morning, we are going to have corporate prayer for our VBS workers and for the kids. And so if you are a worker uh, in VBS, we're going to ask you to come forward at the end of the service so that we can pray for you as a church and pray for what God will do uh, in our midst this coming week. So that being said... Um, we are in Matthew chapter 5, and we will be really covering verses 17 through 20 this morning. This is really the central passage of the Sermon on the Mount, or as some people call it, Jesus' Discourse on Discipleship. This is the central, like, key um, aspect of the sermon that Jesus gives to his disciples and to us this morning. And as, I, as we think about it, and as we look at it this morning, um, it reminds me of growing up in high school and then in college and then in seminary and in business school. It reminds me of some of the best teachers I've had. Now, not every teacher I've had was a good teacher. I have to acknowledge that to you. But I did have some great teachers that really were helpful to me in learning the subject that I was there to learn. And one particular professor of mine that I remember, he was my Hebrew professor in seminary. And at the beginning of the class, the first week of the class, he took a Bible, he lifted it up and said, this is God's word. And, you know, the guys in the class, amen, you know, all that. And then he proceeded to rip portions of the Bible out, particularly the entire Old Testament of his Bible, he ripped out in front of his students and left them with the New Testament and said, this is what most Christians believe is the Bible, right? The New Testament. They don't give much emphasis or much validity to the Old Testament. It's there to learn about Bible stories, but there's really not much else, other value that a lot of Christians place in the Old Testament. And, you know, when you're, when you're in seminary, and when you see a, a seminary professor ripping out the Bible, that kind of gets your attention. Um, you know, I don't, it, now, this is what we found out later. It was Velcroed, so he would do it. <laughs> so he would do it every semester, like for the new, or every year for the new Hebrew students. He would re-rip out the Bible, and then he would put it back together. I do not have a Velcro Bible, or else I would have done the same thing, honestly. Uh, that would have been a memorial, uh, memorable uh, illustration. But the reality is, church, is that we as Christians oftentimes, at best, are confused with what to do with the Old Testament. And at worst, we misapply it or we ignore it. And so that's what Jesus is going to teach us, how we ought to relate to the Old Testament this morning. And as I talked about, there's, obvious, there's, there's two kind of extremes when it comes to how we as believers relate to the Old Testament. One extreme is what is known as theonomy or Christian reconstructionism. And then that's on this side. And then on the other end is what's known as antinomianism, which is against the law. That's what the word means. But you have those two different extremes. And so those that would hold to theonomy would teach that Christians as well as modern nation states should be ruled by the standards of the Old Testament civil and moral law. That's on the one extreme. And then on the other extreme, you would have antinomianism or those that teach that because Christians are now under grace, that there is no longer any, any role for the law in the Christian life. And so they completely ignore the law. Well, I would say most of us will probably find ourselves somewhere in the midst, somewhere in that spectrum between those two extremes. And oftentimes, where we land on that, it, you know, we can kind of suss out a little bit by asking questions like, well, what are Christians required to tithe? 
are Christians uh, still obligated to observe the Sabbath day? Um, and so there's various views of that depending on where you fall on that spectrum of your relationship to the law. Now, my intent this morning isn't to answer those questions for you, but we are going to talk about our relationship to the law and, and why it is what it is. It begins with Jesus understanding what Jesus taught about the law. Now, when I was growing up, I was taught that none of the Old Testament applies to Christians unless it specifically was reaffirmed in the New Testament. That's what I was taught. But I recognize now that there's some, even maybe even here this morning, who believe that all of the Old Testament applies to the Christian unless it is explicitly revoked in the New Testament. Well, I would say that after studying our passage this morning, after studying it this week, um, I'm convinced that all the Old Testament remains relevant to us as believers, but none of it can be rightly interpreted until we understand how it has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In other words, every Old Testament text must be viewed in light of Jesus' person and his ministry and the changes that he introduced by giving us the new covenant. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, and that leads us to our main idea. Because Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, we obey the law when we live in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, we obey the law when we live in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, our passage this morning is found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and th- through 20. I am ask, going to ask you to read it with me. We'll have the passage on the slides, right, gentlemen? Yes, all right, here we go. So read along with me aloud as we read Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the psalmist writes that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Teach us this morning that the best way to delight in the law of the Lord is to delight in the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ. Your law points to him, and he fulfills every iota and every dot of your law. Because of him, we have received new hearts from the Holy Spirit with your law written upon them. Because of him, your commands are no longer burdensome. We thank you for your righteous law, but we thank you most of all for the righteousness we receive through faith in your Son. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. So this morning, we're going to look at two questions. We're going to answer two questions that I believe Jesus addresses for us and for his disciples in this passage. The first question that he addresses is, what is Jesus' relationship to the Old Testament? And he's going to answer this question for us. He's going to answer his how he relates to the Old Testament. And he begins by doing that in verse 17. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And so Jesus says, clearly, Jesus did not come to abolish the Old Testament. And it's helpful for us to understand when he says, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. That phrase, the law of the prophets, is used to describe the entirety of the Old Testament. 
And so he's basically saying, I did not come to abolish the Old Testament. That's not the purpose of my ministry. And that word abolished here means to annul or repeal or to make invalid. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the Old Testament, to annul it, to repeal it, to make it invalid. And we'll see this later on in his ministry uh, when he interacts with some of the religious leaders. But what we see, the reason why we believe he's saying this now is because apparently early on in his ministry, some were already beginning to uh, accuse Jesus of teaching and living, living contrary to the law of Moses. And certainly, as we'll find out later in Matthew, there's times that he does things that the scribes and the Pharisees are saying, well, by what authority are you doing these things? And they would question while he's allowing his disciples to do certain things that just seemed uh, unlawful. And so Jesus, early in his ministry, again, he just began it over in the previous chapter, chapter 4. Early in his ministry, he's already beginning to teach and do things that some are accusing him of uh, being living and teaching contrary to the law. Now, we do know his teachings would have contradicted and, and will contradict some of the things being taught by the scribes and Pharisees. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees de developed and created what's known as the oral tradition. And it was, a, it was a collection of about 300 additional regulations that they used and taught the people. And the point of that was to put a fence around the law. Well, if the law says don't do this, in order for us not to do this, then we need to do these other things. And as long as you you know, as long as you abide by the fence around the law, then you're fine. You'll never break the law. And so Jesus would come in contact with some of those oral traditions, and he would say, that isn't what the law is. That's not what the law teaches, guys. What are you doing? And so Jesus would teach and act in ways that would contradict some of this oral tradition. And he would show, his teachings would show how this oral tradition failed to properly understand the true significance and meaning of the law. So that's why he says, I did not come to abolish the law. But he says, despite the accusations made against Jesus, Jesus is clear that the purpose of his teaching and of his ministry is not to abolish or set aside the Old Testament. Well, if Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, what did he come to do? Well, he answers that again in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so Jesus did come to fulfill the Old Testament. He did not come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. And Jesus is clear again that his purpose of his teaching and his ministry is to fulfill or to accomplish the Old Testament. Now, the word here to fulfill means to carry out or to bring to full expression. That's, that's the, the, the Greek word behind the translation, to fulfill. And notice he says he came to fulfill. He didn't come to preserve. He, he didn't say he came to confirm the law. But he said he came to fulfill or to accomplish or to complete the law and the prophets. And the reality is how he does that is that the law and the prophets and really the entirety of the Old Testament points to Jesus. And he is their fulfillment. They all look forward to him. One commentator says, in other words, Jesus' life, ministry, teaching, death, and resurrection explicate or explain the true meaning of the law. So the law is fulfilled in Christ because the law has been pointing to him. And once he shows up, he, is, he, is, he, he completes, he fulfills, he accomplishes. And he's also, he interprets the law. He is the authoritative interpreter of the law. And now, we've already seen in our study of Matthew, multiple times when Matthew details for us how Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecies. You begin back in Matthew chapter 1. Turn your Bibles back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 22. Angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. 
Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Verse 20, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and he shall, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So beginning at the very first chapter of Matthew, you see how Matthew is constantly pointing us to how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of, out of Egypt I call my son. Matthew 2, 17. This was fulfilled that what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Matthew 2, 23. And that was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. Chapter 4, verse 14. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. In fact, there's 12 times in Matthew where he refers to how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies in his birth, his ministry, and in his crucifixion. So Jesus certainly fulfills the Old Testament prophecies in his person and work. But Jesus also fulfills the Old Testament by his authoritative teaching about the true purpose and the meaning of the law. Because all of the Old Testament points to him, he is its sole authoritative interpreter. When the, when the Pharisees and the scribes would teach about the Old Testament, they would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says this, and such-and-such, and, such, and this was written by the such-and-such. Such. When Jesus says it, says, this is what I'm telling you it is. He says, you heard this. This is how you were taught. Let me tell you what it really means. And Jesus taught with authority. In fact, if you look at the end of, at the, end of the Sermon on the Mount, look over with me to chapter 7. At the end of 7, verse 28, it says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Why were they astonished? Verse 29, For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he teaches with authority what the Old Testament means. He doesn't hedge it. He doesn't say, well, so-and-so says this and such-and-such such says that. Now, oftentimes, I have to acknowledge to you as a pastor, when we read a passage of Scripture that is a difficult passage to understand, I sometimes do that. Like, well, some commentators say this, some commentators say that. I mean, if Jesus were here, he'd say, this is what it means. And that's what Jesus did when he was in his earthly ministry. He came on the scene and said, this is what the law means. And he'll talk about five different examples we'll get to after this section. Uh, that he, he brings it, he brings authority to what the Old Testament taught and what the Old Testament meant and how it applies in areas where the scribes and the Pharisees were all over the place. So Jesus fulfills the Old Testament by his authoritative teaching. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament and, and the ethical requirements of the Old Testament by his perfect obedience to the law. And also by him bearing the punishment and the curse of the law that was required for disobedience on our behalf. So Jesus fulfills the Old Testament by fulfilling the ethical requirements and the, the requirements for the curse that comes on all who break it. Again, he never broke the law, but he bore that for us. And of course, Jesus fulfills the, sacri the sacrificial system established in the Old Testament, both the need for a priesthood as well as a need for a sacrifice. He fulfills all of that by his death on the cross. So Jesus fulfills the law. It all points to him, and he fulfills it all. But it's helpful for us to understand that in his fulfillment of the Old Testament, Jesus reaffirms for us the absolute authority and the validity of the Old Testament scriptures down to the smallest components and individual words. You see that in verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. 
So Jesus is affirming the authority and the validity of the Old Testament Scriptures down to the smallest Hebrew letter, the Yod. It's like, it's like an apostrophe. And down to the smallest uh, dot of a Hebrew letter. It's like the difference between a, a, an F and an L, right? You have a couple little, little squiggly lines that go across horizontally. Jesus says the law is, is authoritative and valid even down to that point, and I'm here to fulfill all of it. So Jesus affirms, not only does he fulfill it, but in fulfilling it, he affirms its validity, its validity and its authority. So all the Old Testament scriptures find their fulfillment and completion in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And none of them will fail to be fulfilled or accomplished, is what Jesus says. So this is Jesus' relationship to the law. He didn't come to do away with it, to abolish it, to annul it. He came to fulfill it. He came to complete it. He came to accomplish it. It all points to him. And in his person and work and in his ministry, he fulfills the Old Testament. So, the next question that we then have to ask is, well, then what is our relationship to the, New Testa- or to the Old Testament? What is his disciples' relationship to the Old Testament? And this is where he answers this for us in verses 19 and 20. He says, therefore, whoever, this is referring to his disciples now, or to those who may be teaching the law, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So the first thing, what is our relationship with the Old Testament? The first thing that I believe we need to understand and to hold to is that we are to hold the Old Testament as the inspired, authoritative Word of God. It's not a supplement to the New Testament. It's not an addendum. It's it's not a nice-to-have. It's not optional. The Old Testament is the inspired, infallible, authoritative Word of God. And we should maintain and teach a high view of God's Word, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, early on in the Christian church, there were heretics that would come and basically say, you know, the Old Testament, we don't, that no longer applies to the Christian. And basically, like my Hebrew professor, they would remove the Old Testament from the, from the church and from the, in the, the, the Christian Bible, and they would remove parts of the New Testament even that referred back to the Old Testament because they felt like the Old Testament had no place in the Christian life. Well, Jesus says what he teaches here is that no, God's Word, all of it, Old Testament and New Testament, is the inspired and authoritative Word of God. And that's why Jesus says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So not only should we maintain and teach a high view of God's word, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, but we should not dismiss the Old Testament as irrelevant or unnecessary to Christians. In other words, we should not be antinomianism. Antinomians, anti meaning against, no, namas, the law. Think about it. Think about what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, when Paul wrote to Timothy, they basically just had the Old Testament and maybe one or two letters circulating that we now know as the New Testament. But the New Testament that we have today was not known when Paul wrote what he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Paul writes, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. Well, what are the sacred writings that Paul's referring to? The Old Testament, the law and the prophets, which, he says, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, Christ Jesus isn't even mentioned in the Old Testament. How can it make you wise unto salvation through faith in him? Because it was all pointing to him. I mean, when Paul went into a synagogue, that's what he was pointing to. He was reading Old Testament to the Jews and saying, these are all fulfilled in the man, Christ Jesus. Sorry, I realize I'm getting a little excited. 
I'm going to calm down. I'm going to simmer down. Simmer down, Tom. But this is what Paul is saying. The Old Testament, look, you can get saved reading the Old Testament because it all points to Jesus Christ. And not only that, not only, is the only, not only does the Old Testament make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ, but he says all Scripture is breathed out by God. Again, he's primarily referring to the Old Testament. It's inspired by God. And what? It's profitable. What? The Old Testament's profitable for Christians? Yes, it is, he says. Well, how is it profitable? He says it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So church, I just want us to understand that we should not dismiss the Old Testament as irrelevant or unnecessary. We should be teaching and learning and studying the Old Testament. We spent however many months going through the book of Genesis recently, right, in Sunday school, and then also we preached through the first 11 chapters here. That's profitable. That is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. Teaching our kids the Ten Commandments is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Studying the book of Leviticus is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. All of the begats and the begots and all of the genealogies that we find in Numbers and in Chronicles and Genesis, those are all profitable. They're all inspired for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. So church, our relationship to the Old Testament should be, first of all, that we should hold to the Old Testament as the inspired, authoritative Word of God. But secondly, we are to understand and apply the Old Testament in light of Jesus' fulfillment. And this is the important part, and this is where we get mixed up and confused. This is where we kind of go off the rail sometimes. We are to understand and apply the Old Testament in light of Jesus' fulfillment. So again, first of all, how do we do that? First of all, we should understand how the Old Testament points us to Christ Jesus. Because it does. Every aspect of the Old Testament points us to Christ. Let's walk through some of it. The The Old Testament, for instance, tells us who God is and shows us what he is like. The Old Testament shows us that God is our creator. He is our sovereign. He is holy. He is righteous. He is just. He hates sin. The Old Testament demonstrates that we are sinful. That we are born in our sin. That we are hopeless and helpless apart from God's mercy, His grace, and His forgiveness. So the Old Testament not only points us to who God is, but it points us to who we are. And that we are sinful. That every aspect of our our life is corrupted by sin. And the Old Testament also points us to a coming Messiah. All the sacrifices, the priesthood, all of that points us to something something beyond ourselves that we need help We need rescue. We need deliverance. And all that points us to a coming Messiah who would come to destroy the works of Satan, who would come. He's the the seed of the woman that would crush the serpent's head. He's the seed of Abraham that would give blessing to the nations. So he comes not only to destroy the works of Satan, but to deliver us from our sins. He comes to be the lamb, the sacrificial lamb that we need. He comes to be the priest to mediate between us and God. He comes to restore our relationship with God, the one that was broken by our rebellion. And he comes to give us new hearts to love God, to know God, and to obey God. All of the Old Testament points to Christ, that that's what he is coming to do. So we should understand, when we study the Old Testament, whether it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus Numbers, Joshua Judges, Ruth, right? First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. I'm not going to name all because Frank and I are working on it. We're still working, right? All of it points to Jesus Christ. Now, you're going to say, well, can I find Jesus on every, every, in every verse? No. But you see these themes that are repeated throughout the Old Testament. 
who God is, who we are, our desperate need for, for God, for, for, for deliverance from ourselves. Like I'm, I'm right now in my Bible study, in my Bible reading, I'm going through 2 Kings, right? And we're, in, we're into the time where all the kings are either doing things that are right in the eyes of God or not doing things in the, right, uh, in, in the eyes of God. And it's just like, what is, it, what, is, what is all that, what is all studying all those kings, where, how does that help me to be a better Christian? It helps me realize how terrible I can be in my own heart. It, it shows me that I need a deliverer. I need a savior to give me a new heart. It shows me how God blesses those who place their faith in him and believe with his word. So the good kings of Judah teach me I need, to be a man of, I need to be a man who serves God with my whole heart. Like all of those things, again, it points us to the work of Christ, our need for him. So we should understand how the Old Testament points us to Jesus Christ. Now here's the second point that will be a little bit more, hmm. We should obey the Old Testament commands, but how we do so must be informed by the way Jesus fulfills and teaches them. Right? And this is where some of us go off the rails. We should obey the Old Testament commands because he says here about the least and the greatest. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying our relationship to the Old Testament is that we should obey the Old Testament commands, both the least and the great, but how we do so must be informed by the way Jesus fulfills and teaches them. Again, the law pointed forward to Jesus. It pointed forward to his activity, his ministry, his life, his death, his teaching. And so, because the law points forward to Jesus, it is properly obeyed by conforming to Jesus' life and death and his teaching. In other words, he's the authoritative interpreter of the law. And as we get, go through Matthew, we'll see, you, we'll see him many times refer to or give us authoritative teaching regarding this is, what the old, this is what you learned from the scribes and Pharisees. Well, let me tell you what it really means. I think that one of the most helpful passages of Scripture to understand how we are to obey the Old Testament in light of Jesus' fulfillment is found in Matthew 22. Why don't you turn there with me? Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36. It's a familiar passage. Verse 34 says, But when the Pharisees heard that he silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, of course, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On all these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. And so even there, Jesus basically hangs all of the hundreds of commands and prohibitions that we read about and study in the Old Testament on two main ideas. How are you loving God and how are you loving others? And so when we read that and we understand that that's how Jesus summarized the entirety of the Old Testament, the entirety of the law, that is helpful for us in how we ought to obey the law. But look with me, you don't have to turn there, but at the end of the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 20, this is part of the Great Commission, he says that when we go into the nations, that one of the aspects of us dis making disciples is teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. So as Christians, there are commands that we ought to follow. Is it all the... 300 and some commands or whatever they are in the Old Testament? No, but there, are, there, is a, there is a namas, there is a law that we must obey, and that is the teachings of Jesus Christ and how he interprets the Old Testament for us. In 1 John, the Apostle John says, By this we know 
that we love the children of God when we love God and what? Obey his commandments. He says, for this is the love of God that we, what? Keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now again, is this referring to all of the Old Testament? It's referring to how Jesus has interpreted the Old Testament and fulfills the Old Testament. So he's not saying, oh no, you go, God, go, you're back under the law. He's saying, no, Jesus, as the authoritative interpreter of the law, has explained to us how we ought to live in response to the law, and we are responsible for living our lives in obedience to how Jesus explicates the law for us. Now, again, this is where some Christians go off the rails. And they either turn to legalism or they turn to, I'm just rejecting all of it and I don't need law, I don't need any of that. I'm free from it all and forget it. But let me give you a couple examples, maybe some helpful illustrations. Um, I have a bookmark in my Bible. It's the Ten Commandment bookmark. And when I was at Grace as a children's ministry uh, director, we gave these out for, to our children who memorized so many scripture passages that we had for them. So we, on one side, we gave them the Ten Commandments. Because again, I believe it's helpful for us to study and understand the Ten Commandments. Um, they're, they're helpful for us in many ways. You shall not have, you shall know the gods before you. You shall not make unto yourself any grave, graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor and you shall not covet. Now, that's on the one side. On the back side, we wrote this. And this is how we understand and, and see the Ten Commandments in the light of, the, of Jesus' fulfillment. The Ten Commandments are found in Exodus 20 and then also again in Deuteronomy 5. And then a couple bullet points. God gave us the Ten Commandments because he loves us. He wasn't a cosmic killjoy and says, aha, I'm taking away all your fun. He's doing this because he loves us. He knows that human, we cannot flourish as a people, as a society, if we disobey these Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments show us what God is like. So the reason why children should study, and we should study the Ten Commandments, is because we understand more fully the character of God. The other thing that the Ten Commandments teach us is that we are not able to keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. You probably can't even keep one of the commandments perfectly. But that's part of the, 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 the use of the Old Testament is to show us that we cannot keep the Old Testament perfectly. And because of that, the Ten Commandments show us our sin and our need for a Savior. The other thing that's helpful to understand is when we read the Ten Commandments that even though we could not keep and cannot keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, there was one who could and did. Jesus Christ came and kept the Ten Commandments perfectly on our behalf. And then the last thing that we put on the back of the, on the, back of the bookmark says, we are saved not by law keeping, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And then there's a reference to Galatians 3. So, yes, the, we should obey the Ten Commandments. We should obey the law, but obey it in how it was fulfilled and authoritatively interpreted by Jesus Christ during his ministry. And also, if you think about it, the, Old Te or the New Testament, once you get past the Gospels and you start getting into the epistles, they're basically trying to explicate the Old Testament in light of Jesus. And that's what Paul is doing. I mean, read Paul. Read his letters. He's basically explicating the Old Testament in light of Jesus and saying this is how we ought to live. And this is, he starts off with the indicatives of the gospel. This is all that Christ has done for us on our behalf. He's fulfilled all the requirements of the Old Testament law. He gives us grace. He gives us forgiveness because of the gospel. And when you place your faith and trust in Christ and when you turn from your sins, then you ought to live in light of that. And how ought you to live in light of the Old Testament and how Christ has fulfilled it? And he spells it out for us. He usually takes the, the first half of his letters to give us the gospel, the second half to give us, and this is what it means. This is how you apply it. Now, Romans, he takes, what, 11 chapters to explicate the gospel and the rest to teach us how that we are to apply it. 
But yes, we ought to obey the Old Testament as it is fulfilled in Christ and explicated by him in his ministry. So, the last aspect of how we are to relate to the Old Testament, we are to believe what the Old Testament teaches about heart righteousness. Verse 20, For I tell you, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that phrase, you will never enter, is the most emphatic way that you can say no in Greek. It's like, no, not, ever, never, anytime will you ever enter the kingdom of heaven. And what Jesus is saying here is that works righteousness won't give you access to the kingdom of heaven. You can be as works righteous as the scribes and the Pharisees, and that means nothing. You can be as moral as you want to be. You can be as nice as you want to be. He says, that is not going to gain you access to the kingdom of heaven. When the Pharisees and the scribes would teach the Old Testament, they said that the law contained 248 commands and 365 prohibitions. Jesus isn't saying here, well, if you can keep as many as those, more than those than the Pharisees or the scribes, then you can enter into heaven. That's not what Jesus is saying here. It's not the number of laws that you keep or the number of prohibitions that you keep that will grant you access into the kingdom of heaven. Because what, does, what do we learn elsewhere in, in, in our Bibles? That a violation of just one of those commands, a violation of just one of those prohibitions makes you guilty of all the law. So if I keep 247 of the 248, I'm still under the curse. If I keep 364 of the 365 prohibitions, I'm still under the curse. And we know that we can't even keep any, anything close to that. So you cannot produce inner righteousness through external obedience and conformity to the law. You can look good, dress up nice, come to church, give your money, whatever you do, serve in the church. None of that will earn you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Well, what will? And this is what verse 20 kind of leaves us hanging. Because he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, then how do I enter the kingdom of heaven? And this is what Jesus was getting at. A heart of righteousness is needed to enter the kingdom of heaven. You don't need more good deeds. You need a righteous heart. And look, this isn't new to Jesus. Jesus just didn't come up with this idea that we need a heart righteousness to be right with God. This starts back in the Old Testament. That's why we need to study the Old Testament. Back in Back, in the, back when Moses wrote Deuteronomy, he says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. At the end of Deuteronomy, he says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. You can't do that by just more, more works righteousness. You need a work of the heart, something done to your heart. That's why the prophet Isaiah said, because this people draw near, with, draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. We could be really good at playing church. Dressing up, saying the right words, singing the songs, praying the prayers. And Isaiah says, your heart is so far away. We need something more than just works righteousness, church. Well, what is that? Well, Jeremiah prophesies for us and tells us what this is. He says, for this is the covenant. He's talking about the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. 
That's the new covenant that Christ came to establish. And as Eric read this morning, how does that all take place? He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Church, we don't need more works righteousness. We need a heart of righteousness that is given to us through the personal work of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. So Jesus isn't telling us that he wants his disciples to practice more external righteousness. Well, you know what? Just put on more lipstick on the pig. That's what we need. But maybe some rouge. We don't even use rouge anymore, I found out. You know, maybe some more makeup. We'll make the pig look really nice. That's what you need. Jesus says, no, you don't even need it. You need to get rid of the pig, is what he's saying. Yeah, he's not saying we need to practice more external righteousness. He's saying that that those who desire to be his disciples must possess a completely different type of righteousness than the scribes and the Pharisees. And this is heart righteousness. This is righteousness that becomes ours through the work of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And that comes through belief and repentance. So church, because Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, We obey the law when we live in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ. He's not calling us to go back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. He fulfilled it. It's important for us to study the Old Testament sacrificial system because all of it points us to our desperate desperate need for Christ. And it comes down to, again, church, the gospel. We need Christ. We need to place our faith and trust in Him. We've already explained to you what the Old Testament teaches us about God. He's created us. And because He created us, He gets the right to tell us how we ought to live. And the Old Testament teaches that He is holy and He is righteous and everything He created is good and without evil. But as we were going through the book of Genesis, we saw that man rebelled against God. Adam and Eve says, you know what? I know I'm not supposed to eat of that fruit, but guess what? It looks good. I want to be wise. I want to be like God myself, in fact. And so, you know, forget God. We're just going to do what we're going to do. And so the Old Testament teaches us that what originally God created us to be good and to to glorify Him, we chose instead to reject Him and rebel against His authority, disobey His rules. We declared our independence from God, said, we don't need you. We can figure this out on our own. And this is what the Bible calls sin. And the Bible says that we've all sinned. And we all fall short of the glory of God. That means every part of our human existence is corrupted by sin. And it's under its slavery. That means our understanding, our personality, our feelings, our emotions, even our wills are enslaved to sin. And the Bible says because of our sin, we earn what? What do we merit because of our sin? Death. We merit death. We merit spiritual death. We merit physical death. We merit um, being separated from God. And because of our sin, the Bible says we are all born into this world separated from God. We're all born condemned as rebels and we're subject to the righteousness the righteous wrath that God has revealed. But again, the Old Testament teaches us, makes us look forward to something else, something different is coming. And what is that? What is coming that is going to meet the demands of God on our behalf? And that is Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Although we are born under the condemnation and wrath of God as sinners, the Bible says that God made a way for sinners to be made right with him. And while we were still sinners, it says God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to save his people from their sins. And as we'll read in Matthew, Jesus lived a perfect life of obedience to the law. He didn't deserve the curse that he received on the cross, but he willingly gave up his life 
for us on our behalf to pay the penalty that we deserved. To, he took the guilt and the punishment that we deserved. He took it on himself. And the Bible says not only did he die on the cross for our sins, but then he rose again in three days victorious over sin, victorious over Satan, victorious over death and hell. And he did so to grant us forgiveness and reconciliation and eternal life to all those who place their faith and trust and turn from their sins. And so just as Joshua said to the people of Israel, choose you this day whom you will serve. Today, God is calling all people everywhere to choose whom they're going to serve. You can serve yourself or you can serve the Savior. You can serve sin or you can serve Jesus Christ. We all serve somebody. And so the gospel is now proclaimed and God calls us to repent of our sins and to believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, some here may not understand what that means. To believe in Jesus means to have your faith in him and to trust him to save you from your sins and to do what he's promised he will do. And to repent of your sins means to turn away from your sins, even turn against your sins and turn toward God in love and obedience. So this morning, God is giving everyone here this morning if you do not know him, he's giving you the opportunity to respond to this good news, this gospel. You don't need the law to be saved. You don't, we don't need to be, like we learned in Galatians, we don't need to be circumcised, we don't need to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. We just need to return from our sins and place our faith and trust in Christ. So if you're here trying to live a life of morality and ethics and goodness and thinking that God is going to somehow, like that's going to get you some access into God's, God's uh, kingdom, I'm just going to tell you it doesn't. You can learn all the memory verses you want. You can read all the Bible. To, you, know, you can read your Bible forward, backwards, 50 times a year. It's not, going to, it's not going to save you. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. So stop trusting in your righteousness. That's what Jesus says in verse 20. Unless your righteous deeds exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never, emphatic, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So stop trusting in your righteousness. Receive the righteousness that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ and in repentance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your son. Lord, he is what the whole of the Old Testament points to. And the whole of the New Testament points back to him. So, Father, he is the focal point of our scriptures that you have given us. So, Father, I pray that we would seek to live a life that is worthy of the gospel, that is worthy of Christ. Not through law-keeping, but Lord, through faith and trust in Christ and in studying what he teaches us about the law and how he fulfills the law. Father, I pray that you would work in the hearts and lives of your people this morning. You would help them to understand the tremendous gift that we have in the Old Testament. And Lord, how it is fulfilled and points to your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that we would delight in your son. Thank him. Thank you for all that he has accomplished for us. Lord, he, he, Lord, he fulfills the law. He, he is our one mediator. He is our perfect high priest. He is our perfect sacrifice. He is even now interceding on our behalf at your thrones. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you how he fulfills the law. And Lord, how he teaches us how to live in relationship to the law. And we pray these things and, and bless your name in Christ. Amen.